Let me get you into the word of God now. We are in Colossians chapter number four. We are looking at a few verses here. I want to focus your attention primarily on verses two through six. Colossians chapter four, verses two through six is where I'm going to spend our focus, our time for the next few minutes. Now, as you are preparing or have prepared your Bible, let me let you know that this letter from Paul presents you and me with divine counsel for living in an ungodly society. Uh, we have to remember that when the world in which Christianity came to be, it was a world that did not know Jesus. It was a Greco-Roman world. Right. It was dominated by philosophy, right. dominated by uh, idolatry, right. saturated in immorality right. and in inhumanity. Well. Jesus stepped into that world. It's amazing to me. We say, how in the world does the Lord expect us to live in America and hold up the standard of Jesus? Uh -huh. Well, imagine being in a world that never even knew. On, the way of God yeah, didn't have Bibles to pass around no, didn't have the same standards I'm not saying it's perfect here but at least folk have heard about the word of God and Jesus stepped into a world like that and he stepped into a world like that to reconcile people to God through his perfect life his death Right. And his resurrection and his ascension, right. he prepared the way yes. to bring mankind back to God. Yes. He did it by means of his work and his church, yes. which he established. And he gave his church instruction yes. for living in a world that was just getting introduced to who the Lord actually is. Right. Now, when we look at this letter, there's a certain flow to Paul's argument. If you read the whole letter, the first thing he says is there's no way of salvation other than Jesus. He makes that point absolutely clear. He says that Jesus is ahead of all things and that Jesus is the worry, the one through whom all things consist. He went on to let us know that life in uh, the community of Jesus has to be different than it is in the rest of the world. That's what he does as he talks about the things he does and what we have as our third chapter and on into our fourth chapter. And then he talks about the Christian life in the world as it is apart from God. And so when we look at this letter, we see that our world, our country, our state and our city is becoming increasingly like that of the first century. This world is becoming more secular. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. This city is becoming more secular. Yeah. Right, all right. It's amazing to me that with the preponderance of churches we have in this city, mm -hmm. in this state, in this country, in this world, the world is becoming much more secular, mm -hmm. spinning further and further and further away from the Lord. Something is wrong. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Something is wrong if the people of God are here Come on. and the world is spinning further away. Come on. There's a disconnect. Come on, Somehow nobody plugged in the plug into the socket. Right. Somewhere there's something where the power is not getting through. Right. And so I thought I would utilize these few verses this morning and focus on how you and I are living Amen. as God's people. Right. I wanted to look at Paul as he ends up this letter. And Paul really provokes three critical questions. These are questions that I want to look at with you for the next few minutes. Let me use as a topic living in an ungodly world, living in an ungodly world. But I don't want you to get focused on the word world. I want you to think more about the word city. Mm -hmm. Because when I say the world, we're, it's too big for us. <laughs> but when I say the city, yes, sir. Right, yes. I'm talking about people you know, Amen. people right. I know, places right. we work, places All we right. shop, mm -hmm. neighbors we have, yes. even family members we deal with. Right. Right. We want to live for the Lord. Yes, 
Well, how do we live for the Lord? The first question that is provoked from these verses is the question, how are we praying? All right. How are we praying? All right. Look at the apostle in verse number two. Continue earnestly in prayer, uh-huh. being vigilant in it with thanksgiving. Let's just digest that a little bit. How are we praying? Let me submit to you that prayer is not a suggestion. It's not an option. Prayer is a must. If we are going to live for the Lord, prayer is a must. This is a statement that Paul makes, not suggesting an every now and again prayer. He says, continue in prayer. This is constant praying. This is habitual praying. This is earnest praying. This is praying as if you breathe. It's something you do because it's a part of the necessity for having life. It's something you do because you realize that without it, you won't survive. Paul says, continue in prayer. Stick your heart, your habit into praying and praying on a regular basis. When we look at a Bible passage in Acts chapter number six. Verses three and four, it strikes me that this is the same language that the Bible uses there. There is talking about the apostles in the early days of the church. When there's an activity taking place, it was giving uh, necessities to the widows. Uh And the apostles were approached by the members who said there's some argument happening among the widows. Some feel that they're not being treated properly. Little prejudice going on here. Prejudice in the church? Oh, what a shock. Is that just 2022? Oh, it's been a long time coming. And so the apostles had a statement to the people. They said, therefore, brethren, seek out from among you seven men of good reputation, full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. But we will give ourselves continually to prayer and the ministry of the word. What am I getting at here? This is something that has to happen among those that leave the church, but it's also something that has to happen among every Christian. Somewhere I read, pray without ceasing. Somewhere I read, men ought to always pray and not faint. You see, it's a necessity. The point then is not that believers should pray with intensity when they pray, but that they should pray habitually and with perseverance. Anything worthwhile, it takes perseverance. Anything that is worthwhile takes some sweat. Sometimes that's literal sweat. It is the idea of I haven't seen it come through yet but I'm going to keep on praying. There are too many people that are more patient with catching fish than they are with catching blessing. We need to pray and keep on praying. And even if you don't see evidence of something positive happening, keep on praying. And so this text is talking about we need to be praying. The question comes up, how are we praying? Why is prayer so vitally important? It is our only communication with heaven. Oh, you don't communicate with heaven by picking up an old cell phone and trying to dial God's number. You don't get to heaven by trying to just holler out in the sky. We get to heaven by means of God ordained prayer. That is the only way that you and I can communicate with headquarters. Let me remind you, headquarters is not down here. Headquarters is in heaven. Headquarters is beyond what we can see. Headquarters is above. You and I are down here and we are dealing as if we are an embassy in a foreign land. You know what you use an embassy for? An embassy is a place that's in foreign territory. And you use that embassy in order to keep in contact with what's going on from the native land. 
People come through the embassy to get connected with the native land. The whole idea of the embassy is the place you go because it's representing God's kingdom down here on earth. We are as if we are our embassy. We represent heaven even while we're down here in enemy territory. There's a movie that came out several years ago. It's called Behind Enemy Lines. It's a movie, if I remember correctly, some soldiers had gotten captured in a foreign country and they were trying to survive. You and I are down here in enemy territory. You got to stop thinking that this world is our home. We may live here. But this isn't our home. We are here on temporary assignment. One of these days, God is going to call a soldier out of this world, out of this church, back to heaven, back to the place where our real home is. But the rest of us have to stay down here behind enemy lines, and we've got to have a hotline to headquarters because it gets tough down here. It's hard down here. So Paul said, And this verse of scripture, continue earnestly in prayer, being vigilant in it with thanksgiving. You are an embassy down on earth. And as you and I wrestle down here with the warfare without and within, we need the strength. We need the support. We need the reinforcement, the reinvigoration, the refreshment that comes from above while we're down here in this world. So we need constant contact with headquarters. We need constant contact with the motherland. But when we raise the question, how are we praying? I'm also asking the question, uh, ain't making the statement, we got to do the right kind of praying. What is the right kind of praying? I'm glad you asked that question. Look at the text of scripture. Look at it again. Continue earnestly in prayer. But notice the next thing he says, being vigilant. Now, why would that be there? Why would he say, be careful, be watchful? What sense does that make, Paul? What are you communicating to our minds? You told us that we need to be habitually praying, but then you dropped in there being watchful. Well... Somehow I'm remembering Jesus in the garden of Gethsemane. Somehow I'm remembering Jesus talking to the disciples that he took with him. Somehow I can hear him say, stay awake, watch with me, pray with me. And I remember him going off on the side and praying and dropping all types of sweat like it was blood. And I remember him coming back to the disciples who were fast and sleep and they said, couldn't you watch with me? Couldn't you watch with me for just a little while? I'm reminded of that when I see Paul say, continue to pray, be habitual in your praying and be watchful. What are you talking about, Paul? Part of being watchful in prayer is recognizing that we are in hostile, devil-run territory. Mm -hmm. And therefore, when we think about that, we have to remember our identity in this world. You and I have a priestly identity in this world. Uh First Peter chapter number two, the Bible says, but you are the ones chosen by God. Chosen for the high calling of priestly work. Chosen to be a holy people, God's instruments to do his work and speak out for him, to tell others of the night and day difference he made for you from nothing to something, from rejected to accepted. We got to remember our identity down here. You see, part of this idea of being very watchful in our prayer is to remember our identity, to remember what we are called to be. Did not Jesus say you are a light in this world? Did he not say you're the salt 
of this earth. While we're down here in enemy territory, we are salt to this territory. We are light in this territory. And not only that, we got to remember what we are up against in this world. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. The one that John wrote in 1 John 2. Yeah. Love not the world. Right. See, John realized that the situation we're in is a situation where we are shown so much good stuff, so to speak, yeah. that we'll swallow it and get caught up in it. Amen. <laughs> Love not the world. Yes, sir. What is the world? Are you talking about the birds and the bees and the flowers? is in the trees? Oh no. Okay. We're talking about the world system. This world has a system. It runs a game on us on a regular basis. This world got game. It shows itself to us in a variety of ways. And if you're not careful, you'll get to love it. You get to the point where you can't get away from it. You get to the point where it tastes so good you don't want to let it go. I remember watching that old movie, The Matrix. Yeah. They've had about 18 of them since the first one. But I remember the first one. There was a guy who was a betrayer. Uh -huh. He betrayed Morpheus. Right. In the movie, there's a scene after he made his betrayal yeah. where he's eating something and he knows it's not real food. But he said, oh, it tastes so good. That's how this world is. Shows us money and tells us to love money. And we say, I know it's going away, but it feels so good. So good. Shows us illicit sexual activity. And we know it's wrong. And we know we can't keep in that mess without destroying itself. But it feels so good. Shows us all types of things that we know know we're wrong and we know they won't last but they feel so good and you get caught up in a world like this and if we don't remember who we are we'll be swept away with the current we got to remember who we are and part of that is to be praying on a regular basis but to be watchful in our prayer the idea of being watchful in our prayer is that thought that is brought out a little bit further in this text of scripture as we'll continue to go forward but the point that the author is making to us right now is that when we pray we have to be vigilant we have to know what's happening yeah. and as we see what's happening right. it'll allow us to be very watchful in our prayer yeah. bible then says continue in earnest prayer be vigilant in it and he goes on to say pray with thanksgiving then he says pray for us the whole idea is that we have to recognize that we need to be watchful in prayer yeah. now i thought about an example that i hope will help us as we think about being watchful in prayer and that is when we look at what's happening over in Ukraine. All right, all right. Yes, Do you know that when you talk to people or rather hear news reports yeah, yeah. from Ukraine, yeah. it's interesting that you hear the Ukrainians, particularly the leader over there, being very watchful uh -huh. in his request yeah. to the United States. All right. All right. He keeps saying, we need these kind of weapons. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes. You sent this, yeah. we need more of these. Uh -huh. You sent that, we need more of these. Yes, and then he got more specific. Yeah. He said, I need some air power. Yes, I don't need you to come over here and fly and, and, and get involved in the fight, but we need your planes. Yes, uh -huh. We need your... You see, he had been watching what was happening and is still watching what is happening to his country. Yes, and so he is trying to stay in contact with a source of power. And he is being specific. He's saying, all right, the Russians are doing this, so I need that. They're doing this, so I need that. He's specific, and what I'm saying, if you can understand that while we're down here, we're saying, Lord, I'm praying habitually because this is what's happening around me. Yes, Lord, I'm having a problem with this. I need some help with this. Lord, I'm having a problem with that. I need some help with that. Being watchful in prayer, vigilant in prayer, is understanding yourself enough to know what's causing you weakness and ask Asking the Lord to help you right there where you were experiencing weakness. 
And so Paul says, how are you praying? Are you vigilant in your prayer? Are you asking the Lord to help you put the specific things that you need? Can I tell you, God doesn't mind you asking him over and over again for the specific things you need. And can I remind you that nobody knows what you specifically you need other than you and God? We pray for one another as a church. We say, Lord, bless this, bless that. But there are things that you don't tell us. Things we don't tell you, things we don't tell one another. And they are pain points. But if we are also, in addition to collective prayer, praying habitually as individuals, we can tell headquarters. It's as if we're saying, Lord, I didn't say this in the assembly when I asked for prayer. But this is specifically what's happening with me. And Lord, I need help right here. Yeah, the enemy has come over my eastern gate here. I need help right here. And God is saying, all you have to do is ask. And I'm able to give you even more than what you need. But we have to pray Habitually, and we have to pray with vigilance. But then, as we go a little further, there's a second question that comes up from this text, and that is a question not just how are we praying, but what are we doing? All right, mm. what are we doing? Come on now. When we look at this text of scripture, yes, sir, and we look at verse number five, we see this part mm. walk in wisdom Come on, well, well. Come on. toward those who are outside mm. redeeming the time. Yes. Yes, Let's sir. chew on that one a little bit. Yeah, that's good. Not only how are we praying, yes, sir. but this text forces us with the question, what are we doing? Yeah. Right. When we examine this part of the text, All right. Paul addresses living in hostile, devil-run devil run territory. As part of being watchful in prayer, there's the need to exercise wisdom. Yeah. Walk in wisdom. Yes, sir. Now, grammatically, it is all of you keep living, behaving, conducting yourself thusly. Yeah, but what is wisdom? We're to behave wisely. Yes. Sir. But what really is wisdom? All right. Well, <laughs> wisdom is the practical know-how. Mm-hmm of doing and implying or applying God's word. All right. uh, say that. Let me say it in another way. Say that. Wisdom can be understood yes. All right. yes. as a crucial intermediate stage between thought and action. Yeah. Oh, I said a lot. You, you didn't miss that one. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. It is an intermediate stage mm-hmm. between what I think and what I do. All right, all right. Wisdom jumps right in the middle. Yes, like the meat in a sandwich. <laughs> it is the intermediate stage yes, between what I think what I do. and what I actually do. All right, all right. That's good. That's good. God is so wonderful. Yes, He's created it in such a way that we have the ability to think about what we have been thinking uh-huh. before we do it. Do it. All right. Come on, Doc. All right, man. <laughs> Wisdom is the practical know-how uh-huh. of putting our transformed thinking mm-hmm. and biblical values to work All right. in any given situation. All right. Oh, Brown, you preaching? Yes, that's good. You see, we need... To see wisdom as that intermediate part. Yes, sir. I'm thinking, use a practical example. <laughs> I'm thinking to tell you off. All right. Mm. You're thinking to tell me off. Uh-huh. But there's that intermediate state yes, between what I'm thinking All right. before I actually start opening yeah. my mouth. That's good. That's good. Wisdom is that intermediate state. Yeah, yeah, uh-huh. yeah. Wisdom is the practical know-how yes, of putting our transformed thinking uh-huh. and biblical values to work yes, in a given situation. Yeah. I like that. You at work tomorrow. 
All right. Mm -hmm. You step in there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you get in there and folk are pilfering, yeah. stealing. Yeah. Well, well. And they're stealing. And as they're stealing, they call on you. Uh -oh. Hey, with you? Come on, brother. This stuff is easy for the taking. Yeah, right. No cameras in here. Come on. Get yourself some. Mm -hmm. oh. Small enough, nobody gonna see it. Yeah, yeah. Slide it out. Yeah, brother. <laughs> Come on. Wisdom. Yes, sir. Tells you. Is the know-how. Yeah of putting your transformed thinking. All right. You know what I mean by transformed thinking? You know, at one time in your life, you say, oh, sure, grab it. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yes, but transformed thinking, I said, wait a minute now. Right. I've been risen with Christ. Yeah. Yeah. Good boy. And it also is putting our biblical values. Yes, sir. Oh, I didn't have any values like Jesus had before, yeah. but now I have Jesus' values. Yeah. Right. Wisdom is taking that transformed thinking and those biblical values, and now you apply them uh -huh. yeah, 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 yeah. in that given situation. Yes, all right, all right. And therefore, you know what to do. Yes, sir. Mm. When you're being called All right. to get yourself some. Yeah. <laughs> I, I hope you understand. Yeah, that's good. That's good. That's what wisdom is. Yeah. It is, I, I need some practice. You know, word practical practice. Yes, yeah. sir. Yes, Something sir. I'm practicing, right? Uh -huh. And you know what they say about sports? You want to be good at it, you better practice. practice. Yes, sir. Some of you saw Steph Curry rain down threes it, the other night. I know some of you Golden State fans. Yes, sir. Steph came in the game knowing they were down 2-1. Steph said, we can't go down 3-1. Right, we, we go down 3-1, we're going home. Uh -huh. So Steph came in and he rained threes. Right. He made it rain. Right. 43 points. Right, Somebody said, well, he just got lucky that night. Oh, no. no. When Steph was a little boy on, in his basketball daddy's house, Steph was shooting threes. When it got to be a teenager, shooting threes. Got to college, shooting threes. Got the NBA, shooting threes. And they say he does it so effortlessly. Dude, come down the court. Man, you got to ask, that's in. That's how he plays. But it took practice. When it comes to you and me and our transformed thinking, it takes practice. When it comes to our Bible values, it takes practice. It's one thing to learn it in Bible class. It's another thing to use it on Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday through the next Sunday, it takes practice. You can't shoot one shot in the worship and then not shoot another shot until the following Sunday. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, we got to be on the spiritual court Come on, boy. Every, day. every day practice it. And wisdom is the practical knowledge. What you learn from all of that practice. Yes, wisdom is knowing how to use it Yes, sir. In a given situation, Amen. Amen. you young men, you get called by a fast young woman on, to go in the wrong direction. Oh, my God. If you've been practicing, practicing yeah. you'll know how to deal in that situation because you will have wisdom. Young women, you getting called by an unscrupulous young man yeah. to the wrong direction. Yeah. If you have been Practicing. You know how to apply your transformed thinking in that situation. Oh, that's what wisdom is. And Paul says, walk in wisdom. What are you saying, Paul? I'm saying to you Christians in Colossae and in Hunts Vegas, if you keep on practicing, when you come into different circumstances, you'll know wisdom enough to know how to conduct yourself right. in that situation. Right. God didn't want any Christian saying, I, I didn't know what to do. Uh -huh. This thing just came up on me. I didn't have any idea how to, I didn't know how to handle it. Uh -huh. What do you mean you don't know how to handle it? God has been telling us yes, sir. over and over and over again. Wisdom is when we apply. That's it. And we know how to apply it right. to a given set of 
circumstances. Yeah. One thing about the devil, he'll put you in a different circumstance every day. Yeah. It won't be the same old thing. Right. It won't be the same old thing. It's going to be a different. Yeah, let me go back to the NBA finals. You know what they do at halftime? They make adjustments. They make adjustments. Man, if you getting boxing one over here, this guy getting free in the corner, he's throwing up freeze, he's making them rain, and, and you haven't figured it out, you make adjustments. You come to the second half, you say, two on this guy. This guy over here who can't shoot, he may beat us, but this guy ain't beating us. We putting two on him. Let's still throw it to Draymond. He can't shoot it. Anyway. <laughs> you make adjustments. You know what you and I have to do in this, this enemy world? We got to make adjustments. If you got by Satan's trap yesterday, don't think he's going to have the same trap today. He's smarter than that. He's going to rearrange the defense, rearrange the offense. He wants to say, all right, Brown, you figured that one out. Let me see what you do with this one. But wisdom says, all right, the circumstances change, but I know how to put into practice my transformed thinking in this circumstance. I know how to put into place. I know what to do with my Bible values in this circumstance. The devil's plans may change, but God's word abides forever. Knock down somebody's water. <laughs> Leave it over there. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. <laughs> and so then let me use another example to help us get this. Acts chapter three and verse six. Let me go back there. I say, I want you to understand what it means to walk in wisdom. Oh, Acts six, verse three. Once again, therefore, brethren, seek you out from among you seven men of good reputation. Watch yeah. this now. Full of the Holy Spirit. Watch this now. And wisdom. Yeah. Now, let's get very practical. Yes, you see, these men were going to be used right. to distribute out what had come in the common collection yes, sir. Yes, to sir. help those widows get equally treated. Right. Yeah. That was their job. Yes, so the apostles said, look, we got to preach the word. Mm -hmm. We got to pray and we got to preach this word. Yeah. We can't do everything. No. So you get some guys who will have enough wisdom yeah. to know that when they're working with money yes, sir. Come on. and they're working with collected goods, yeah. All right. they know how to deal wisely yeah. mm -hmm. so that people won't get it twisted yes, as to how they are managing this stuff. Yes, right, right. Oh. oh that's good. That's good. That's and so those seven men that had been chosen, yes, sir. you know, the Bible doesn't give you all the details. Mm -hmm. Knowing human nature, you can, you can get an idea of what was happening. Yes, sir. These Grecian widows that said, we're being discriminated against. Right. They probably heard about these seven men being chosen to manage this stuff. Right. And I'm sure that, that I'm sure they still had wind in their jaws. Mm -hmm. mm. Well, how do we know you're going to do it right? Yeah. Well, well. Come on. Oh, I got this last week. What should I be getting this week? It seemed like I ought to get two for one since I didn't get enough last week. <laughs> and these men needed some wisdom, wisdom to know how to deal with people who can be very strange uh -huh. even though they've been called to Christ. Yes, sir. Oh, I know I'm preaching. I know you're preaching. Act very strange. Yeah. You need some, let me, let me step in a little further. You know, Whenever there's something that these seven had to deal with, they knew that there, there could be repercussions yeah. if they didn't use wisdom. Right. So they needed wisdom. Yes, sir. All right, this person over here complaining. Oh, this one's complaining. Yes. This one's smiling. Oh, right. yeah. The one smiling thinks that she got everything she's supposed to get. Uh -oh. The two that are complaining, one of them says it's prejudice, and that's why she didn't get what she was supposed to get. Uh -oh. The other one over here says favoritism based on something else, and, 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 and on and on it goes. Right. And then the rumors start. Uh -oh. yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, the reason she got more is because she in with some of the other Christian yeah. men over yeah. here. Yeah. Yeah. Can't you hear it? Yes, Folk make up stuff. Yes, they do. Pull it out of their neck. Yeah. <laughs> see, see, wisdom made me say neck. And so you <laughs> You know what I'm talking about? And so you needed wisdom. 
to settle that mess down. And the apostle said, look, we can't deal with, we're trying to deal with it. You know what Westview needs? More folk with wisdom. Come on, brother. Yes, sir. Amen. Yes, sir. Who say, you know what? We go, look, 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 Dickinson doing this. He got his hand. Stone doing it. He got his hand. Look, look I'm going to handle this. Yes, sir. All right. I'm going to use wisdom. Amen. To cut out the foolishness. Yes, mm-hmm. So the apostles needed to have those men yeah, and work with it with wisdom. Let me give you another example. All right. James 3, All right. verse 17, 18. But the wisdom from above all right, all right. is first of all pure. Right. Mm-hmm. People that have wisdom are pure. Yes, sir. Right. They're pure thinking folk. Right. It is also peace loving. Yes, sir. People with wisdom are peace loving. Uh-huh. They don't go on the job and cause more mess. No, sir. They get that stuff to be peaceful. Uh, right. They solve it. Yeah. They calm it. Yeah. I've been listening to uh, NFL uh, reporters talking for a couple of years now about why Tom Brady left New England. Mm-hmm. And then they talked about this and that and the other. And then they said, well, one of the things that Brady was able to do in New England, whenever Belichick was jumping down everybody's throat and getting a man, Brady was able to keep it calm. Keep it peaceful. Say, look, I know he's a bear. He's a pain in the neck, but he's trying to get us to the Super Bowl. So you guys chill out. We're going to handle this. We're going to keep it going. Brady didn't get in there and say, yeah, let's hang him. (laughs) And as a result of that, much to my chagrin, Patriots kept winning the Super Bowl. You know, we need that Westview. Some Brady-esque attitude. We got to keep, let's just we got to get here. Yes, right, it's hard. It's terrible. It's rough. But we got to get here. Right. You see, the wisdom of God is gentle in all things, willing to yield to others, full of mercy, good deeds. It shows no favoritism and is always sincere. Yeah. Amen. Amen. That's all right. How are we praying? All right. What are we doing? Yes, sir. We need to live with wisdom. Amen. Now, let me step a little further. I'm trying to hasten on. I want you to get this, but I'm trying to hasten on. I want you to see this text. Look at it again. He didn't just stop there. He went on to say, walk in wisdom toward those who are outside. All right. All right. Outside. Yes, sir. Outside is unbelievers. All right. He said, redeeming the time. Now, watch this. We have to be careful about how we act toward and around non-believers. Right. Say that. Say that. A lot of us got to recognize that we in this enemy territory. Come on. Yeah. You got to be careful how you deal with the enemy. Yes, sir. I don't mean the enemy in the sense of uh, uh, somebody that, uh, that has vitriol toward you necessarily. Right. But if you don't know Jesus, you're enemy of God. Amen. Amen. But we have to deal with those that are on the outside. Yes, sir. Yes. How do we deal with those on the outside? We have to consider the impact of our lives right. on the outsiders. Mm-hmm. You're living among this outside world, yes, sir. the city, All right. the unbelievers in this city. Amen. And some of us don't recognize that the way we act out in the world, in the city, okay. has an impact on whether those people get closer to Jesus. Yeah. Mm-hmm. They watch our lives. Mm-hmm. Something we have to always keep in mind, especially given our role as reconcilers and ambassadors in this city. Yes, sir. What is your life doing for people who don't know Jesus? How is it drawing them to Jesus? Or is it repelling them from Jesus? Is it pulling people to the Lord? Or is it pushing people away from the Lord? Some of us act like we don't care. Man, we do any old thing. Do any old thing in this city. Mm -hmm. And folk watching us. And then we're the first ones mad when they say, wait a minute. Aren't you Uh a member of the church of Christ? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. One of it. (laughs) Uh, You're supposed to be representing. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Got to be careful. That's right. One of the the most embarrassing things I had in my life, there have been many. One of them when I was a young man, cutting the fool, and the police officer caught me. Uh No details. (laughs) Caught me cutting the fool. Uh He looked at me and said, wait a minute. Mm Mm-mm. He knew my daddy. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. <coughs> true. Brother, true, true. Brother Brown, son. Oh. Mm. The man had been in the church, too. Uh-huh. Oh, the man. policeman, he had been in the church. Yes, right. sir. Aren't you so-and-so? If I could have found an ant hole. 
<laughs> to crawl into. Yes, sir. Here I am, supposedly, uh, uh, as we say in our vernacular day, baptized, sanctified. Yeah, all right, man. Acting like a fool. All right. <laughs> How we live in this world Amen. has an impact on whether somebody respects the Lord Amen. or respects his church. Yeah. Say that, say that. We try to win people to Christ when we get to our no loca- new location as well. And it's, where's you? It's, I know some of your folks. Mm. All right. Come on now. And I just saw so and so, or so and so just told me. Uh-huh. Oh, that's the worst thing you could do. Come yes, on, sir. come on. You hurt the name of Jesus. Yes, sir. Redeeming the time means that we have wasted enough time in this world, haven't we? All right, all right. We wasted enough time and opportunity uh, living without wisdom. Right. Now let me use money. We 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 talk about money. It's easy to understand. Mm-hmm. I've said this before. Other people have said it. If you had the salary, the income you got coming in right now. Uh, if you had uh, uh, had that income when you were younger, Come on. you probably would have just wasted it. All right, all right. If you had your current salary right now right. at age 13, <laughs> oh, oh, what would you have done? All right. <laughs> You've been worse than some of these athletes. Get a check. Go buy 18 cars. All right, now. Conversely, if you knew what you knew now about money when you first started working. All right. Ooh. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes. Uh, you have a nice piece of change right now. All right. All right. If you, all the dollars, go home and check. Uh, if you got your uh, way to get your, your stubs or way of checking income or check Social Security, look at all the money you made uh-huh. up to right now. All right. Man. Ask yourself, where is it? All right. And then ask yourself, if I had the wisdom I have now about money back then, I'll be in a different world right now. We need to understand that we need to redeem the time because you can't go back to 13. So what what can you do? You start from the day and you say, today is the first day of the rest of my life. I'm going to use wisdom from here on out. And then very lastly, we got one last question. And that is, what are you, what are we saying? Mm. Look at this. Let your speech Always be with grace. Yes, Season with salt yeah. that you may know how you ought to answer each one. Yeah, well, let me go backwards. The each one of the unbelievers. Yeah. Remember, we, in this, we, we behind enemy lines. Right. Right. The goal is to win people to Christ. Right. But we're down here in their world. Right. Well, got to be able to answer each one. Well, let's, let's get, let's, what, is, what is he saying? This is a wrap up statement. It wraps up the theme of our place and purpose in this world, in this city. Mm-hmm. Not only do we need to be alert as to what we keep praying for. All right. Not only do we need to behave wisely in our circumstances, but we also need to be mindful of what we say and how we say it mm-hmm. among unbelievers in particular. All right. All right. All right. One of the best ways to practice the right kind of talk among unbelievers is to do the same among believers. Amen. Come on now. Right. Sometimes okay. Christians say anything to one another. Yes, sir. It's supposed to come in here for encouragement. Yes, sir. Be uplifted. Amen. That's why we that's why we come together. We praise God. Amen. We come to encourage one another. I love coming now. Love and leave. I leave lifted up. All right, yes, all right. Come looking for a word of encouragement Amen. and looking to give one. Amen. Mm-hmm. That's what it's all about. All right. And the way we talk to one another can have an uplifting yes, sir. impact yes, sir. or not down mm-hmm. impact. Amen. You've heard this example before. I got it from Elijah Anthony years ago. Elijah say in boxing, you got uh, two guys getting there and they give it their all against each other for three rounds, mm-hmm. three minutes rather. Okay. And then the bell rings. They in there, you know, going at it, going at it. Then, then right, right, boom, 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 boom. The ding. The guy go back to the corner. <laughs> <laughs> then guys jump in, jump in from the side, and one of them pull the fan out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. One of them getting some water. Somebody washing off the mouthpiece. Yeah. Another guy doing the eye thing. And then there's God in front of his face. You doing too much of this? A little bit more of that? Do this, do that. You all right? You're going to be okay? Keep on going. We got you. We got, we got the ding. They jump out the ring. Yeah. And he get back up in there. He ready now. He ready. He going. He going. He going. Ding. Now suppose that the next time he come down. <sighs> and they jump and they start beating on him. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> 
that man won't make it. Don't beat one another up in the church. We don't need to be whooped in here. This is encouragement time. When you get there, somebody ought to fan you. Somebody give you water. Somebody get your mouthpiece. Somebody take the swelling down. Somebody get up and say, a little bit too much there. Do some more here. You got this. You're all right. Get on back out there. Ding. And out we go again. Yes, we need words that are seasoned with salt. This is gracious speak. This is the idea of sharing words with the outsiders that show them we have been with Jesus. Yeah. Mm, that's good. They are winsome words. Yes, they get attracted to us because of how we're living. And let me tell you something. When you really strive to live for the Lord, I didn't say you're perfect, but you strive to live for the Lord on a daily basis. You keep in mind who you are, what you've been called from. When you talk to people, who don't know the Lord, they'll be able to tell by your conversation there's something different about you. Yeah. Man, man. They're over there telling nasty jokes. Yes, sir. Well, well. You don't get into it. Come on, brother. Right. They're over there talking about political adversaries. Uh -huh. yeah. this, this, this dumb president or this dumb vice president, this horrible ex-president and all that, and you don't get into it. Uh -huh. Come on, come on. You stay above the fray. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. You don't get into the dirt. All right. And when you talk, it's not like you avoid people no. because then they think you're snooty. Yeah. <laughs> What's that word? Stuck up? Yeah. Yeah. No, you hang with folk. Right. You deal with folk, but they can tell you. You laugh and joke, but you keep it clean. Come on, man. Come on, man. You have a good time, but you're never injurious. Right. You joke with people, but you never try to hurt them. All right. Come on. They'll be able to see it. Yes, sir. Amen. They'll be able to see it. Yeah. And sooner or later, they're going to have a chance when you guys are alone. Mm -hmm. And they're going to ask you something oh, yeah. about your life. Yes, sir. And that's when you open up the stage. Yeah. You say, let me introduce you to Jesus Christ. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And you have a chance to win them to Christ. Yeah, but we have to have speech that is seasoned with salt. Yes, sir. Our speech has to be like salt on food. Mm -hmm. You know why you put salt on food to take the blandness away? All right. All right. It's bland. All right. You put some salt on it. Yeah. Ooh, this potato. Yeah. <laughs> this steak, yeah. this chicken, yeah, right. these chitterlings. <laughs> <laughs> Tastes a whole lot better. Yeah. <laughs> but you know, you can put too much salt. Yeah. And you can mess it up. Yeah. What I'm saying is, you don't go around unbelievers and preach to them all day. Come on, yeah. Come on, That's right. Here, let me tell you about Jesus, you heathen. Uh. <laughs> you saw them all day long. You're quoting scripture every time. Yeah. You, 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 you're driving a the car. They're driving in the car with you. You stop at the stop line and the stoplight, and you say, This reminds me why people need to stop sinning. Uh. <laughs> Just a little seasoning. Yes, sir. As Brother Jim Harbin talked about, sprinkle a little Jesus. Yeah, that's right. Here and there. Yeah, and you'll find out you open the door. Right. Man for an opportunity to share Jesus. And so what are we saying? What are we doing? How are we praying as we live down here in this enemy territory? I hope that you're saying, thinking, and praying along with Jesus Christ. Before I take my seat, let me remind you there is a fountain Yes, Filled with blood, yes, drawn from Emmanuel's veins. Yes, right. Sinners plunge beneath that flood, yes, lose all their guilty stains. Yes, if you've never been baptized into Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, yes. there's no better day than today. Yes. You've heard about Jesus. Yes, Do you believe it? Are you ready to change your heart to follow him in every way? Amen. Will you confess him before those that are here? And if so, will you get into the water? Yeah. We got the clothes ready. Yes, we got the water ready. Right. We got the baptized.
dries are ready. We got the towels ready. We got the wet vac ready to kick up the water from your foot, step back to the pot. We got everything ready. We just need you to be ready to come to Jesus. And so as we stand together right now, and